the Thoughty OT podcast. When did you find out that you're ADHD and when did you find out that you're autistic and what kind of, what order did they go in and, and that kind of thing? It'll be really interesting to hear. Yeah. So background, I grew up in that fun slice of Americans who did not vaccinate their children because they thought it would make you autistic. Um, <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was vaccinated <laughs> until I was three years old and then I had a seizure from a high fever after a vaccination and my mom freaked out and stopped vaccinating me and my siblings and no more Mm. from then on out. Mm. So I actually just finished my adult vaccinations in my thirties, which was great. (laughs) So anyway, um, this is to say that what I was raised to believe autism was, was completely non-speaking, right? Like no eye contact, rocking back and forth. Ironically, there are literally video clips of me at two and three exhibiting super stereotypical autistic behaviors, including mm. one of Same. one favorite one of mine. Um, I'm in a box. I'm like rocking back and forth, like having a good time by myself. And my mom starts singing to me slightly out of key. And I just start screaming at her <laughs> to stop. Like It's just like not, you know, I had perfect pitch. Like it's, it's not subtle. Right. So I had all these things, but I was born in the eighties, you know, to these mm. parents and they, you know, they, they just didn't believe that that was possible, basically, yeah. for me, you know, and, and I was the stigma was too yeah. sort of embedded within their yeah. mind about what it is. And exactly. And it was hyperlexic. And so again, like they didn't know that that was a sign and not a, you know, oh, you couldn't possibly be right. So looking yeah. back, I, you know, if I were a kid now, I would have been diagnosed very young because it was mm-hmm. really super obvious. Um, a lot of the things I was doing and saying And then both my parents, so my dad is autistic and ADHD and my mom is ADHD. So I grew up in a very, very neurodivergent household Mm. where things were being lost or where we got, you know, locked out of our house all the time. Like, you know, just like where a lot of, and and we like, you know, my my parents had a lot of trouble doing things um, functionally. And then I have six younger siblings, all of whom are neurodivergent. Yeah, and most six, of, so, six yeah. siblings. Oh my God. <laughs> um, and I most could, of them I are diagnosed or something. <laughs> 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 yeah. So it was a very chaotic household. For me as an autistic kid, it was very, very overwhelming. And sure. so the, the reason I'm giving that background is because in my you know, early twenties, when I, at which point I was you know, done with college I, and I was looking at my life and I was like, I cannot buy groceries. I cannot get my laundry done. Like I can't Mm. do things in my life. When I was trying to figure out what that mapped to besides just depression, I was like, Oh, ADHD. And I know both my parents have ADHD because they, they Mm -hmm. have talked about their experiences enough. And and like my mom at least will say my dad has ADHD. So like they have no problem with that. They're, they're not down with the the autism, but you know, (laughs) really, really really interesting, isn't it? Cause that kind of the stigma around ADHD is kind of this fun fun outgoing kind of a bit messy minded kind yeah of just kind of weird and fun and yeah you know party animal kind of like attitude, haha whereas... you lose your keys all the time like that's yeah. kind of funny um <laughs> like the story my my family tells is that my mom at one point made my dad five sets of keys and <laughs> when he lost the fifth one like after not very long my mom thought about it and she was like i think it's in your red coat and he was like oh i lost that coat so i mean like he just like could not <laughs> he went to work he, he was a pastor and he went to work one time without shoes or pants on. Like he like got to work and realized he wasn't wearing shoes or pants. He was just wearing like shorts and he was like, well, it's Sunday and I have to like, I have to, you know, I can't go to church like this. Stay, so anyway. stay behind the altar. <laughs> just like cr- crouch behind the altar, make sure. No oh one my sees. God. Yeah. So, so <laughs> for me re- going, Oh, I'm ADHD. Like that was a, not a jump, right? Like that was just yeah. like a, yes, this is in my family. You know, this makes sense. I know that people in my family struggle with stuff like this. And it's also just not as stigmatized. So, you know, that that just felt, and I actually didn't know at the time that part of autism is also executive function issues, right? So that, mm. you know, I'm if I'd known that, if I'd known more about it, autism actually might have looked more prominent in my history in certain ways. But anyway, so I, I did seek an ADHD diagnosis. It was a very weird experience. I, at the time also had an incorrect bipolar diagnosis, which I think is extremely common for ADHD people specifically because we have very yeah, autistic cyclical women energy. as well. It seems yeah. like uh, exactly. bipolar, BPD, 
schizophrenia even I've heard. Yeah. But like in particular, the the really cyclical energy of ADHD of having these like big bursts of energy and then needing big rest and like a lot of rest, like that looked like bipolar. And so when I went and got the ADHD testing, there were, you know, two issues. One, because I had bipolar, they were like, well, we can't give you stimulants. You can't have stimulants. Right. So Mm -hmm. I've actually Mm -hmm. never had stimulant medication. I'm thinking about trying it soon. (laughs) Don't get get that, that. (laughs) pharmaceutical grade uh my phantetamine <laughs> i i want to try it and just see like what does this do to my brain i think i've heard enough stories about it to know it's not it's probably not going to do what i hope it's going to do but i want to have that ex- I'm, I'm curious about the experience that i've heard neurotypical people can mm. have of their brain just being quiet i'm like what is that <laughs> and it's 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 interesting isn't it because it's it was designed as a way to produce energy it's you know right. amphetamines are these it's to make you productive make you yeah. productive and, and have all this energy but a lot of the experiences that people who are adhd have is that it calms their brain because it it kind of it's weird isn't it why would you give a high like a very energy inducing <laughs> hyperactive medication to someone who is naturally quite hyperactive and like yeah you know all, all over the place in terms of thoughts and behaviors and stuff it doesn't make any sense but it's yeah we it's, don't it's understand the brain <laughs> that's you know yeah we still don't know how most psych meds work for example no depression yeah. depression meds like i think the way that they found out that serotonin was important with like depression and mental health disorders is by giving someone something that impacted their serotonin and then being like hey that's that must be a reason and that's that's you know, something that I I think about a lot because from doing my uh, biomedical sciences course, you know, I know that the way that science is supposed to work is you're supposed to find a target, find a reason, have a mechanism, do trials around that, and then produce things that might be able to counteract that. Whereas with antidepressants, it's like the opposite way. It's, um, it's yeah. still not very understood. Either. No, it's really, I mean, that I, I, I think of that every time we take a medication that most of the time when I read about it, it says we still don't understand the pathway through which yeah. this survivor is just like, that's the norm in, in medication. So, you know, there's a long way to go there. Oh, but, but back to my ADHD uh, testing story. So when I did the testing and then, you know, come back and they, and, and also it was like a student testing me because I was in Boston and you just like, you keep, mm. You get medical care by students when you're in a, a city that has a lot of <laughs> med schools. So he sure. was like in school to become, you know, whatever. So when he started the, you know, kind of reciting back the results to me, he started with, well, obviously you have an extraordinary mind. And I was like, he's not going to help me. <laughs> like, um, and that's, you know, kind of the problem with adding in the, the giftedness element is, you know, one of the things he was saying to me is he was like, you probably just you know, it's probably frustrating for you when you're in the 99th percentile of a bunch of stuff to have things where you're not, you know, to have things where you struggle. And I was like, he was saying, his example was like something being in the 50th percentile. And I was like, no, no, that's fine. But I'm looking at my actual results and I have things that are in like the 16th percentile, but I maxed out the verbal part of the test. Like I read, they ran out of words for me yeah. that, you know, cause I knew all of them, <laughs> like, yeah. like there, there shouldn't really be anything in my brain in terms of like focus where I'm in the 16th percentile for something. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't mean shouldn't in like a, you know, metaphysical sense, but like, you know, just, just the the, sec- according to like the, how most, right. most people are neurotypicals might be right. in, in terms and of. And that I have this very like uneven focus pattern. Um, mm. and one of the things actually that they pointed out in both, cause then I did neuropsych testing for autism uh, two years ago. One thing they pointed out in both parts of the testing is that I have a much easier time focusing when the task is hard because it's interesting to me. (laughs) So I did better on the hard tasks and then I did terribly on the easy tasks, which is like a really Mm -hmm. classic, right? So both autism and ADHD, I love the term interest-based nervous system, like that I I Mm. can't do anything or it's, it's very, very hard to mobilize myself to do anything that is not interesting. And, you know, there are a lot of ways around that, right? I can like listen to, I listen to podcasts a lot, you know, while I'm say doing dishes or something, right? If I have to do something that's boring, I can make it more interesting or like try Mm. to stimulate myself in some way. 
but that was another thing. And, you know, the testing. I relate to that. I relate to that a lot. (laughs) Totally. And so I actually just looked back again at the results of my neuropsych testing, just kind of side by side, because they were five or six years apart from each other. And how, and and in one of them, I was heavily caffeinated. And in one of them, I had no caffeine because I was like, I want to see what my brain does without. Hmm. And looking at those numbers, I was just like, I don't see how anyone could look at this and not think I was struggling. Like looking at the, just the huge variability. And uh, I know from, you know, learning more about it, that one of the things they look for in ADHD is like extreme differences Um, in the bell curve between different areas. So having like really, really strong competency Mm. in one area. And again, like I had those, you know, a couple of things that were just really well. Spiky profiles, exactly. Where, you know, your brain is doing some things very well. And then Mm. some things your brain is just like, no, thanks. I have no interest in doing that. And I won't, and you can't make me. Yeah. It's, um, it's really interesting. You're talking about that kind of high level of like competency that you have in different areas that, because a lot of the ways that the medical system works or even the education system works is that they flag people who are not doing well in in terms of academically or in terms of life. So, you know, there was, there was quite a long period of time pretty much throughout the entirety of secondary school or, or high school where I struggled massively with, you know, burnout and getting off going off school sick due to anxiety and struggling with the social sensory aspects of school. So I was not doing well at all. And, you know, I, I went through a lot of mental health pathways because of that, but the school never really picked up as an, as an issue because, you know, I was pretty much a straight A student. You know, I, I, I did well in the academic side of things. It was just very much like the, the social emotional aspects of, growth through education that I really struggled with, which I think is equally, or if if not more important than than the academic side of things. So it's it's, it's kind of interesting. And then when you look at them, like the medical system, most people get diagnosed when there's a problem, like, and you kind of need a problem for um, people to diagnose you to be like oh there's right. an issue like that's so the definition we, is it has to be affecting your life pretty pretty much pretty much and it's it's quite contradicting to the idea of how why most people want to go for that which is to like affirm their identity and to you know understand oh hey this you know this is something and and for some people it's useful some people it isn't but you know it's you always need to have some kind of difficulty for like medical educational professionals to take you seriously. It's almost like waiting for it, like waiting yeah. for something to happen. And because the focus is on productivity and doing well in school and at work, honestly, they don't really care if the problem is just that you're not happy in your relationships or like, sure. you're, you know, you have to be at a, a very high bar of misery and depression before mm. it counts, right? Like you, it's mm. not just mm. like, oh, I'm not thriving um yeah you, it's like like coping isn't it like they want yeah. you to be able to it's like, like my mom was saying in the podcast so i was talking about my life it was like you know i was coping with school yeah to a certain degree i was not feeling good about school i was not developing myself emotionally and and socially at school i was doing i was doing the work that i needed to do but in in all of the other areas i was coping and you know we were talking about that and I don't think it's, I don't think it's good enough just, just to cope, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's necessary some of the time, right? Like <laughs> that was, a, that was certainly a but big it's not part the of ideal. my life, but it's not like the, ideal. the ideal. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I, I've had this experience. I know a lot of neurodivergent adults who've had this experience where they were in therapy and because they'd gone to therapy in crisis, as soon as they were out of crisis, their therapist was like, oh, you're good. Like, you're fine. I can graduate you. Yeah. And you're like, what? Like, I don't want to kill myself today, but that's not a very high bar for life. Mm. <laughs> like, mm. uh, you know, not doing well. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's reflected in the mental health systems as well. They, they want to get you out of the red zone. But once you're out of the red zone, it's not, it's, it, you know, they're not that bothered. You know, so like, Perhaps in in my my early early teenagehood, 
when I had a lot of ideation, um, a lot of like harming behaviors and things of that nature. Then they were, they were full on, like it was like weekly sessions, weekly support. It wasn't helpful, but they, they still took it seriously. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that now I'm in kind of in adulthood. I do need that, that support in terms of therapy, but I don't have that ideation side of things. And so, and I don't particularly have the, the harming side of things either. So those kind of that red zone that people would be in that is, is not something that I'm part of, but, it, but I'm not any necessarily doing better. Like yeah. in, in, in areas of my life, it's just my shift and my mindset has changed. Hey up YouTube, hope you have enjoyed this podcast clip so far. If you want to check out the full episode, you can find it here on my YouTube channel under the podcast section, or you can go to Spotify, Apple, Google to check it out on different podcasting streaming services. If you have enjoyed this video thus far, please make sure to like, perhaps drop me a subscribe if you want to see some more content from me, and drop a comment down below, even if it's something simple like an emoji or a, or a heart. Uh, it really does help satisfy those big, YouTube algorithm gods in the sky. Anyway, I'll let you go back to it. Yeah, I think about this so much because I've been coaching for four years now. Mm. And I, if I, okay, so my like handles on the internet right now are ADHD flourishing. So I was like, okay, you know, flourishing, thriving, this is nice, right? It's not just about that, um, you know, coping, but I absolutely do not mean that in the sense that like people need to be, you know, producing at some particular level or need their life to look neurotypical. And I was finding that unless I was being really explicit about that and saying, I want, I want you to feel good, right? Like I want you to feel good in your life. And that's the point, not your external production. People were coming to me for these like external type problems, right? Like mm. I need, or I want my mm. career to look I different. Need this, I need that. I need yeah. a friend. I need a relationship. I need. Yeah. These, these yeah. sort of external markers of success. And so I think about that so much because for me in my own life, like the external markers of success have never helped me psychologically, at least for more than, no. you know, a few days or no. something, right. I might get a little rush of dopamine or something from getting an award, but like <laughs> then it's done. And I was like, oh, totally. whatever. I, I relate to that so much. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. But that's what we think of as flourishing because that's the those are those external markers of success that we're those told. highlight real. Yeah, movie and that's like the like reason moments. you should take stimulants, right? Is like oh, yeah. so you can go and and do Produce. stuff and like be impressive. Mm. But we know that that doesn't actually make us happy in the long run. Sure. Like it's the sure. day to day, it's the relationships, it's you know the way we're talking to ourselves and like self love, which is cheesy but important. Like. My internal self-talk is just radically, radically different than it was when I was focused on achievement. Because mm -hmm. you talked about sort of like the ADHD side of things. At what point were you like thinking about or, or questioning? Because I know for a lot of people, there's always this like this part of them that they don't really understand. And they, you know, the diagnosis that like medical professionals give you, they don't fully explain everything so at what point were you like hey there's there's something more than than adhd and 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 mental health yeah i think actually having an autistic dad who was extremely traumatized and not a nice person made it harder because i was like oh i'm a lot like my dad but mm. i was just like oh that's trauma right so every everything sure. that i now see in him as an autistic trait i thought was just like weird trauma stuff or just like mm. being smart and you know kind of a weirdo so it was actually kind of hard for me to see. And I had a really, really great therapist about five years ago who was like, hey, so this diagnosis in your chart is not a thing. This weird amalgamation diagnosis you've gotten over the years, which at that time was rapid cycling bipolar one in full remission. Sure. She was like, that, that's, that's not real. Like that does not exist. <laughs> bipolar one does not go into remission and rapid cycling bipolar does not go into remission. I had had no, no, no symptoms in seven years. Mm -hmm. um, I was still medicated for it, but I had had like literally no symptoms. Um, and the reason I'd gotten the rapid cycling diagnosis is because I wasn't having long, I wasn't really actually meeting the diagnostic criteria for bipolar. I was having really bad meltdowns and sure. those meltdowns looked like, you know, I mean, they, they could be all kinds of things, but basically they were like, well, you're having these like episodes, they were calling them episodes. And then, you know, 
got the diagnosis over time, kind of these things. Uh, and so she was like, you know, and she had an autistic kid and she was kind of guiding me a little, you know, I'd say things she'd be like, Oh, my kid does that. So she was kind of like guiding me in this direction to look at maybe considering autism. Mm. And as soon as I did with her, like when I was like, looking, I was like, Oh yeah, this is me. And this is my dad. Like very, you know, very. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I still went through that period. Like a lot of people do in adulthood of, you know, Oh, I don't want to take up space in the community or I'm not sure, mm, you know, don't all, take the, up all resources these things. And exactly. Voices. And, yeah. yeah. And so I, I was for a while, I was just identifying as neurodivergent. Generally, I was like, I am very neurodivergent. <laughs> that was the term I was using. And then actually at the lockdown at the beginning of the pandemic, my anxiety plummeted by like 90%. Yeah. Even though I was anxious about what was happening in the world, obviously, sure. like my personal, I was like, I don't have to get on the train every day. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not going to work. Like mm. I can, I have the having control over my space. Um, and this is weird, but this is just one specific thing that helped. I also had my own bathroom for the first time in my life. I was in this um, subsidized apartment through the city with my sibling and we each had like our own half. So we each had our own bathroom. So yeah. having control over my space and being able to keep my space clean for the first time in my life, um, you know, not having other people like messing it up, like mm. being able to do exactly what I wanted with it and realizing the extreme extent of my preferences yeah. <laughs> that like most people don't have preferences that are this strong or that upset them this much. Sure. And, and all of these things kind of happening, you know, at once I was just like, Oh shit. Yeah. I'm definitely autistic. Like the, mm. the, within, you know, two weeks of lockdown, I was like, this is, yeah, this is definitely, this is what's happening. Um, and so, you know, really started identifying with that and, and my, you know, my therapist totally agreed and was like, yes, we can, you know, provisionally put this on your chart. The reason I sought an official diagnosis was actually because I work with neurodivergent people. And so mm. I both wanted, I was like, I want the experience of the formal diagnosis yeah. to be able to talk about it in case, you know, my clients want to seek it out. I want to be able to talk about it in, you know, from personal experience. And I was like, if I'm going to have this be part of my public identity and I'm going to be talking about it, mm. I just feel better if I have the official Diagnosis sure. And I think, I think that's something that, you know, I think within the community, people are very um, happy and, and open to people self-diagnosing. But I, I, I do also see that, you know, the, the utility of having the diagnosis, just especially when, you, when you're going out and you're talking about your experiences, like it must be like a lot more, you must feel a lot more like safe in yourself, like to, to, to to do that kind of thing. Yeah. And it's, it's a little bit unfortunate that, I mean, I, I, because I completely a hundred percent and behind self-diagnosis yeah. and also, you know, I have an autistic brain that's sure. literal and, you know, has a weird relationship with authority in certain ways. And it's just mm -hmm. like, I, I didn't want anybody to be able to call me out sure. and I, I wanted to be like, no, this is, this is real. I have it on paper. Mm hmm you know, all this. So anyway, so that's, that's, that was kind of a weird, um, intersection there of my like values, I guess, yeah. where part of me was like, I shouldn't need it. And then part of me was like, but I, I want it. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And I now know that it would prevent me potentially from emigrating to a variety of countries. So I maybe would not have sought the official diagnosis if I'd known that. Really? Yeah. There's a bunch of countries in Europe that, uh, you cannot become a citizen of, uh, or you can't, you can't apply for like, moving there if you're autistic oh my god yeah like which countries <laughs> <laughs> I, I watched a video about this the other day i don't want to i don't want to say the wrong ones um because i don't remember all of them but I, I remember just being like oh shit well well and then i also know it can be an issue with um custody which i mean i don't have kids but mm. you know like it can be it can be brought up against you in custody battles like yeah. all kinds of things you know I, my partner and i own a house together mm -hmm. and they are on the spectrum but not diagnosed so like if, and you know, I don't imagine this would happen, but like if we were to be in some kind of legal fight over the house, um, they could potentially use my diagnosis against me again. They wouldn't. And I am not actually worried about that. I just know that I'm like, oh, great. Now I have all these <laughs> potential, yeah. you know, problems from having the official diagnosis. 